Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. This is Jack Young, and today in studio, we've got uh, Brother Dale Morey, and he is a missionary to the jail ministry. He's got a very interesting story, and I'll have you a blessing to you today. Uh, so welcome, Brother Dale. Thanks hey, for being man. with us. Thank you, sir. Appreciate he, it. He's going to present his ministry tonight yes. in the evening service, and he's going to preach for us. We're looking forward to that. Then the youngsters are going to play volleyball after church. Hey, so I'm sure good. Be fun. So, yeah, yeah. So we... Uh, you know, we get to people at church however we can. Sure. Sometimes you got to bribe them with Understood. volleyball and ice Food. cream. So. <laughs> All right, right. We'll do, <laughs> we'll do what we can. Yes, yeah, sir. And um, but uh, thanks for coming on, yes, sir. Appreciate and, having. Uh, me. You have an interesting testimony, yes, sir. And so the Lord is uh, is using you and has used you already in in jail and prison ministries. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, we we uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of I grew up in a, a rough home. My my mother had her. Uh, her own addictions and uh, her own problems and such, and um, uh, she kind of let that be known. She was abusive. Her boys, boyfriends were very abusive. Um, at this time, I was being molested by a man, uh, also being molested by a woman, and that just uh, that created a lot of hate and bitterness in me. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's not, it didn't make me who I was, but it just added uh, fuel to the fire of my sin nature that was already there. Um, because of those things, I grew up very hateful, and I felt... Uh, uh, that when I went out there and hurt others is when I got the relief. Mm -hmm. And um, as I fit and you were patterning the behavior that you saw in the behavior, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And so, um, thank God I was never sexually abusive to anybody, but mm -hmm. physically and verbally uh, abusive. I did a lot of jail and prison time uh, because of that. I became a very violent person. And um, you know, after doing things for so long, the Bible talks about having a seared conscience. Mm -hmm. And my conscience became very seared. It became where uh, things that would bo bother a normal human being bothered me no more. And, you know, people, I have people ask me all the time, Pastor, they say, how can a person do those things that they do? Mm -hmm. Well, their mm -hmm. conscience is shut off. They've learned how to, to put that away. And, you know, the Bible talks about because of that seared conscience, we lose a natural affection mm -hmm. uh, towards other human beings. That's why... I, you know, women can go out and have abortions and, mm -hmm. and men can shoot people because they've lost that ability to have that compassion on another human being. And don't you think it was a culture in which you were raised as well as that you had 100%. been desensitized to certain behavior? Oh, yeah. Kind of like if you were raised by cannibals, you would Correct. have, uh, you know, sit down and have some elbow macaroni. It sure, really sure, that's right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir, exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, as time went on, um, I was 16 years old. I did my first jail bid. Um, that's where I ran into my first life in a gang. I was in two gangs. Um, this one here was my first one, brand new to it. And I just felt like a sense of belonging, like I belonged to something in that mm -hmm. gang and such. And so I kind of fell in love with the lifestyle. I know a lot of people don't understand that type of thinking, uh, but a person can become uh, accustomed to being in jail and prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did. And so um, by the time it, I was eight, go ahead. Yes, a, lot, a lot of these folks, because um, yeah. you, you were there. Yeah. It's um, if you're a member of a gang or a community of uh, criminals, that's sure. kind of like your family. And, and then you had uh, you had father figures that you didn't have naturally. Correct. In that, and then um, then then also going to jail, like you're just just saying, it really doesn't it doesn't bother you. You're not scared. Like that's I've right. never been incarcerated. Right. I never got caught. Praise the Lord. Uh, amen. Thank you. And Jesus. so yes, I've never been behind bars. That's right. It's, that's terrifying to me. Sure. Sure, and and to somebody like me, uh, it was just a natural thing. It's right. what we did, and that's what a lot of the guys uh, are that I face. You know, I had a guy tell me this. You weren't thinking either. No, uh, like what, no. what? What am I? Well, you weren't thinking like, uh, oh man, my mom's going to be so disappointed, right. or right. my dad. No, you no. didn't have that uh, under underpinning. Correct. Yeah. yeah, we didn't have that. And a lot of the guys I work with don't have that. And the ladies I work with, you know, I had that one guy tell me this. He said, you know, Dale, he goes, my, my grandmother stopped selling crack at 85. Yeah. My mom's, you know, a blood. My dad's a blood. I'm a blood. He goes, that's all I've ever known. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to them, doing what they do is just a natural thing. It's their environment. People who are incarcerated, a lot of them, like I've talked to correction officers. Sure. That, uh, well, I've been working here for 20 years, and I've seen three generations of the same family. Same family. You know, the grandfather, the son, yep. and the, you know, the grandson is now. It's sure. A, it's a culture. Sure, it is. Yeah. And so, you know, by the time I was 18, I'm, I, I go to my first rehab. I'm up in uh, Vermont because I'm on the run from uh, New York. Uh, they put me into a rehab. Uh, at that point, the doctor, you know, they put you through detox and such and do blood work. And he just said, already at 18 years old, he goes, I see that you have a, your liver 
you know, it's, mm. it's already uh, being affected by the alcohol. And so he says, you need to quit. Well, you know, quitting was because of my conscience being seared and, and trying to shut everything off. Alcohol and drugs became a big part of me shut, being able to shut that off, being able to shut those things down. So uh, drugs and alcohol help uh, help me to put that conscious aside. Sure. You know, and, and a lot of guys, too, when they get incarcerated, there, there's not there is, you know, some drugs and alcohol and and. Sure in prison or whatever. Yep. Uh, but most of the guys, it's an opportunity to get cleaned up and get healthy. Yeah. And you know what they do? They run to the psych doctor and get their meds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every time you go into yeah. jail, med, med cart comes right. around. Yeah. That's right. Go, go there and tell the psych doctor you want to kill yourself and everything else. And they, they give you meds to make you very numb. Yes. And so, but you're right. They come off the hard street drugs and alcohol and they mm -hmm. turn to other medications. Right. And, and so I, it I, just becomes a habit. Something you yes. do. Yeah. You know? Complete lifestyle. Sure, 100%. Cycle in uh, to yep. prison and cycle out. Cycle out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, being on the run, three different states, um, always in trouble and such. Uh, my last bid was in New York State uh, in front of, uh, matter of fact, I was serving for an armed robbery bid down in Florida. Uh, when I got indicted up in New York State, the federal government, every single Wednesday, they fly inmates in the skies. Every single okay. one, it's called airlift. Okay. And so every Wednesday, you can count on it from the morning until night. There's inmates being flown across the United Con, States. Con Air. Con Air, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh. exactly. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. It's interesting. They have buses and uh, vans that uh, they also travel across uh, the United States or whatever. But So they flew me up here to New York. Uh, when I got off, um, I was facing 12 and a half to 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, they were tired of it. Um, end up waiting. Um, they offered 7 and a half to 15 I just said, you know, it was, it was at that time when I, f for the first time, I heard who this Jesus was. It was in jail. Mm -hmm. My mother never brought me to a Catholic. I never even knew there was a Bible. Who God? Who's this God? Mm -hmm. And so I started hearing about this Jesus and this God, uh, you know, from other inmates and such. And um, I, got, I had interest in it. Um, but it kind of scared me because I would just thought everybody used that as a crutch. Yeah. You know, religion yeah. was just another cloak to put on. In in in, in the jail, um, yeah. The, the the inmates and then also the correction officers as well, the unsaved ones. They look at uh, religion as oh yeah, it's just jailhouse right. religion. Jailhouse religion. So you had fear of of you being just a jailhouse, just religious. That's bird. right. And as soon as you got out, you go back. Right, and, and, and that happened. That happened numerous times. Mm -hmm. um, I would leave Jesus Christ at the gate, and I went home. You know, left mm -hmm. all my Bible stuff, and and it really killed my family. Yeah. Um, it, it was very hard. It, today, they see the life change. They see uh, what Jesus Christ has done to my life and what he's doing in my life. And yeah, I still can't get them in church because in their back of their head, I still have a jailhouse religion. And uh, they will not come to church because of it. And so, 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 there was a, so there was a few times in your life where yep. you, you um, were in, into the programs in the jail. You're reading your Bible and Correct. doing all the discipleship curriculum and all that stuff. Yep. Um, but it, it didn't affect your heart and your life. That's right. You know, that there was that void still there. Okay. Um, and I was wondering why that void uh, never uh, was filled. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, why, why was it still there? What happened is, you know, later on I learned that I had made a jailhouse profession. And because I would come to the altar or I would on the edge of my bed yeah. in the prison. Yeah. And I would confess to God, well, I'm sorry for being an alcoholic. I'm sorry for being a drug addict. I'm sorry for, you know, doing this or doing that. And I remember God showing me Psalm 51, 17 clearly. Uh, clearly, I had a broken heart and a broken spirit every time I went to jail or prison. Mm -hmm. But there's another word in there. And that word, what Paul calls um, godly sorrow. There's that contrition, right, right. that deep sorrow for what you've done against you, the whole. You definitely God. had sorrow because you, you uh, natural sorrow because you Correct. got caught. You then you're you're sorrowful because you're going to have to Correct. stand before the judge. Sure, um, and also you're worried about your family. Sure, on the outside. Yep, and um, and so there is a lot of natural fear, natural sorrow sure thing. inside prison, but not the fear that leads to uh, repentance. godly repentance. That's right. Yep, and, yeah. and Paul is clear on that worldly sorrow and yeah. godly sorrow. Yeah, because I mean, you know, yeah. Judas repented. That's right. He, he was real sad, sure so did. sad that he hung himself. That's right. That's and he, right. You know, and he gave he gave the uh, the thirty pieces of silver back. That's right. That's right, brother. You can't get any more um, physically repentant right. than that. No question. Yeah. And so, you know, because, brother, th the fact of the matter was, and, I, and this is what drives me uh, to get back into the jails and prisons besides God putting that calling on my life, is there are many, many men 
who really do want out of that life. They mm -hmm. really do mm -hmm. want something mm -hmm. different. Uh, they just don't know how to get it. No. They've learned how to put different things on to survive out there. You know, you got to, uh, you know, to get, in order to get in, to fit in, you put on this cloak and be this and you do that. And so they've done learned how to do that with religion. Jailhouse religion has just become yeah. another cloak that they've put on. Very knowledgeable men. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sure. Because um, they have got time on their hands and uh, yeah. they will study the Bible, do the discipleship sure. curriculum. 100%. Have, uh, go to every single Bible study that there is. And uh, yeah, they will have a, a pretty fair amount of understanding yeah. Yeah. Uh, of, of God. That's right. Knowledge buffeth up. Yeah. It deceives them into thinking there's something they're in, not. And these guys um, in jail or in prison, sure. uh, they're not... They're not there because they're stupid That's or right. ignorant. Exactly It's because right. they're sinners. 100%. And some are really good sinners. Very good. You know? Sure. Um, and they're, they're, some of them are highly intelligent. Sure. But in the back of their mind, probably too, I mean, the, um, yeah, they're not saved. Um, well, they're not saved, but and then in the back of their mind, too, is they're thinking, man, you know, my 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 parents were this way. Sure. My grandparents are this 100%. way. I, I can't change. Imagine being that hopeless. Yeah. I, and I, you yeah. know what? Um, I didn't get saved till I was 22, and I could say yeah, that, no. like, even as a preacher's kid, that sure. I, I was the same way. Sure. I, I've heard young people say this. Well, this is just who I am. Mm -hmm. True statement. True. Very <laughs> that true. Is, that is Absolutely. very true. That's why you have to be regenerated. That's right. And given uh, That's right. a new life in Amen. Christ Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. And so. Uh, after I got sentenced, Honorable Judge McCarthy, he told me this. He said, Mr. Moore, he goes, what I want you to do is I want you to take these five years in the penitentiary. He said, I want you to learn how to be a productive member of society. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that look like to me? What does that look like to a person that's grown up in the streets and, you know, in the drugs and gangs and all? Because at this time now, I'm a pretty high level gang member. OK, I mm -hmm. mean, I have a lot of power in this gang that I'm in. I'm what they would have called a first. And I had a lot of power. There was only one other person above me, and that would be the president and the vice president. Mm -hmm. But he was real good friends of mine because I started out as his security. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, uh, here I am. I have all this power. I have, all, you know, the, the brothers are bringing taxes Belong into me. belonging. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And so it was then when I first met, uh, well, what, he told me to go in and be a productive member of society. I said, well, I'll go in prison and I'll, I'll learn and I will take all these programs that I can. And I mean, I, New York has a lot of programs sure. to offer. Okay. Uh -huh. And so I went in there and about three years into my bid, I just remember saying, this is not helping me be a better productive member of society. No. It's just helped me conform to be a better inmate. Yeah. It's just train me how to face for my next time that I come in. Yeah. And so um, it was then that I ran into Old Time Baptist Church, okay. uh, who would come in and do Thursday night Bible studies, and and uh, man, you gotta come to Bible study. Nah, you know I don't need that religious stuff and so on. And so they would before before the study, they would go through the pods and invite everybody. They would, yep. They mm -hmm. call you. You do it was a Thursday night or whatever. So men would come up and say, hey, you know, why don't you come to this Bible study or whatever. And how they really got me was I had been reading uh, the Bibles, many versions of the Bibles, but it was always the King James that stuck out to me. Something just always stirred in me with that King James Bible, yeah. like no other book on this planet, brother. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just telling you, it's really what woke my conscience back up. Amen. It's what really gave me that, that uh, natural affection towards other human beings. It's really what helped me. Uh, understand what the Holy Ghost was trying to show me about myself. Mm -hmm. And and so when they told me, yeah, come here, this preacher, his name is uh, Pastor Lou Godano. They call him the hammer, you know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, who's the hammer <laughs> to me? Awesome. You know, a hammer. At the hammer. Brother, he walked in. At this point, he was getting sickly. He had a cane. He was about 320 pounds. And, man, uh -huh. he just walked straight up to that pulpit. And I him telling you, he just started preaching. It shut my mouth. Yeah. I have never heard nothing you, like that. You were just that. blown away. I was, look, I just started crying. I didn't know what was going on with me. You know, I was yeah. starting to get that, uh, get my conscience back. And it, it was giving me feelings that I had put away for decades. Yeah. And here that man's up there preaching that Bible. Man, it's stirring inside of me and I'm crying. I'm just like, what is this? So much so, guess where I ran to the psych doctor? Because I thought I was having a breakdown. Yeah. I just didn't understand that my conscience was coming back. Yeah. You know, they say if you cut off the circulation in a, in a finger or something uh -huh. for a long period of time, and you take that off, and that when that blood rushes back in there, it hurts. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what happened to me wow. with my conscience. Wow. And I'm sitting underneath that preaching. Yeah. So um, I really got serious about it, and it was at that time that I approached the gang that I was in and told them I can't be in this anymore. They're like, you just can't walk can't away. Can't go. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And... um. And so they said, well, come back in 30 days. It was the worst, longest 30 days of my life. I slept with my eyes open. I never was anywhere by myself. 
you know, they thought I was probably trying to infiltrate or turn on them or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so they, they would have just killed me. And so um, I went back out into the yard and they were like, you really want out? I said, yeah, you know, I've been going to church and stuff. They said, well, how do you get out? And I told them how we get out of things. And I had my stuff packed up in my, in my bed because I thought they were going to kill me. I thought they were going to cut me or put me in the hospital. That's really what they do. And uh, he just looked at me and said, well, there's another way. And I said, what is that? He said, religion. I'll take it. I had no clue what religion is, but I'll take it, you know? Uh, so what they did for the next two and a half years, they put a watchdog on me. Uh-huh. So everywhere I went, no matter where I went, if, that, if it was the bathroom, was in the shower, walking around the prison compound, I had somebody watching me all Just the time. Just making sure you weren't Just snitching. Making sure. or, yeah. 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 And so sure enough, I got about six months left. You know, time goes on. I got about six months left before I go home. And that I went out to the yard for the last time would be my last meeting as a gang member mm-hmm. before I was saved. Wow. God delivered me from a gang before I was saved. Yeah. I didn't get saved until I got out of prison. Okay. And um, God delivered me from that. But, you know, I think the Lord seen in my heart that I really did have a love for the truth, that I really was seeking and being and diligent. You were being drawn to the truth. 100%. I think this is so important for people to realize in a culture that uh, is so secular that people yeah. like yourself have never opened up the Word of God, seen the Word of God. They don't know the stories of the Bible. That's right. That it took you, I mean, years. Years. Of having the Bible being... Uh, implanted in you before you made that decision for Christ. So it wasn't someone coming That's across right, with, uh, you know, t- taking five no, minutes no, and, no. Uh, hey, say this prayer. Um, but no, it was it was that gospel penetrating your heart. No, and your 100%. Life. Yeah. You know, religion doesn't change people no. like me. Yeah. And I, so I think it's so important in churches yeah. to be patient with people That's right. and just, just teach them the gospel, teach them the gospel, teach them the gospel. Yeah, 100%. And I, I did see that quite a few, quite a bit uh, in our ministry up at Fort Drum, the soldiers. Oh, Fort Drum, Is that yes. um, uh, people coming in who are not saved, that, um, you know, going over the gospel with them, but they keep on coming back to church sure. and they would read their Bible. And then uh, finally, sometime after months, they would, their hand would go up. They're ready. They're ready. No. That's right. But it, it, it was a process. That's right. Amen. Yeah. And, you know, it, it took them years. You know, the night I got saved, you know what God showed me about myself? That I was a rebel against the holy God. I Amen. never understood that until that day. Why? Because I kept going to the altar. I kept trying to come to Jesus yes. with my worldly sorrow. Right. When and God, your repentance before you got saved was kind of like a work, 100%. an earthly work. That's right. 100%. Yeah, it was the same. Yeah, same way when I got saved is that I realized um, it was true conviction. I realized I was an enemy of Christ. Oh my goodness! It wasn't like someone had to show me that Lord, right. the Lord Jesus was a savior. Sure. I already knew that. That's right. One hundred percent. Yeah. So I was completely condemned yep. and convicted, and I just told the Lord I was sorry. Yes. You know, and if he if he would have squished me like a bug and sent me to hell sure. right then, I would have been at peace with that because that's yeah, what I deserve. That's right, you would deserve. Yes, and sir. I was, you know, just 100%. completely sorry for my yeah. sin. That's when I felt the forgiving joy sure. oh, of oh. the Lord right then. So, Brother, t- so tell us about how you got out and got saved. The, well, so I get out and I end up meeting my wife, and um, we, you know, I was going to a church trying to find a church. Uh, it was very hard to get out there because. A lot of churches, they found out where I came from, and mm-hmm. they, they, you know, like to keep me in the back, or you know, only you know, we'll keep an eye. They're worried on you. about so, you, yeah, very, very worried about yeah. me, rightfully so. I get, I understand that, and so it really um, that pushed me away for quite a few years. We couldn't find a church. We left Buffalo. We moved out to where we are now in Allegheny County, mm-hmm. and there was just a completely nothing. And so um, one day, uh, my mother, my mother in law, works at a college um, in. Um, Arcade, New York. She's mm-hmm. a secretary there. Well, my pastor's daughter, because she was homeschooled down south, she was going to get some credits up here to finish her homeschooling at the college. Well, she's having it now. The college is about an hour from my house. So here's my pastor's daughter, an hour away, has no clue the lady she's talking to. And she tells her this. She says, my dad just became the new pastor at the Black Creek Baptist Church. Mm. And my mother-in-law's jaw dropped. She said, can you say that again? She said, my dad is the pastor at the Black Creek Baptist Church. Her words were, go see my son and daughter. They're in dire trouble. We're drinking, stealing, we're robbing from churches. I mean, you name it, we're out there doing it. Yeah. My wife didn't grow up that way. But because yeah. of the lifestyle, she got drugged into that. Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't long. Uh, probably a couple of days later, car pulls up in my driveway. I'm outside smoking cigarettes, drinking a beer, trying to mow the lawn drunk. And this man comes walking up to me. He said, hey, 
John Asquith, new pastor at Black Creek Baptist Church. Uh. And he said, uh, I'd like to invite you to church. I said, no, I don't need your Jesus or your church. I said, that stuff doesn't work. I said, it's fake. I tried it. It's my words to him. He said, oh, that's fine. He goes, but I just want you to know. So he just started conversating. And um, as he conversated, my wife's listening. And mm-hmm. so I just kind of kind of told him, I said, look, man, I'm already saved. I don't need to be saved. That's what I'm telling him. Yeah. Because I had made a profession in you, prison. Yeah, you knew the lingo. You know the, yeah, the, <laughs> the hoops to jump yeah, through. Yeah. Sinner's prayer. You could have sure. told him about that. Sure. Yeah. And so uh, – my wife ended up going, thank God. She ended up going to church. Uh, she was going for a th- couple, three months or whatever, and I would make fun of her brother. I mean, I would, you holy roller, you're a Bible thumper now, and blah, blah, blah. And it would just tear her up, you know? Yeah. And it was at this point she was praying that God would kill me. She just couldn't take the abuse anymore and such. And so one Sunday morning I was hung over, and she just said, Honey, would you please come to church? She goes, This man preaches a King James Bible like you never heard. Now, she knew that that King James Bible always meant something yeah, special yeah, yeah. to me. And I just was like, what? What did you say? She goes, he preaches a King James like you've never heard before. I said, all right, I'll go teach him a few things. I sat in that pew, brother, and he opened that Bible and just started teaching it. Man, I just was stunned at what I was saying. I was just, you know, it says that the world become guilty. They, yeah. Their mouth is yeah. shut, and that's what I was. And it wasn't long after that that I, I ended up getting saved. Um, God showed me that I was a rebel. Yeah. Like, and it, it was a special speaker that we had come in from down south, and he was preaching. Now, how long did you go to the, the church before you got saved? Four years. Wow. I sat in that pew for four years. Now, here, let me explain that a little bit, because a lot of people get confused. You know, the Bible says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Mm-hmm. And so here's my diligence. I would tell, you know, people, I'm really seeking God. He just doesn't want to save me or blah, 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 or whatever. Yeah. But I would miss church. I wouldn't read. You know, I, I, out there drinking and smoking, mm-hmm. you know, addicted to pornography. But that is what I'm trying to convince people. And, that and at the same church. time, you really re- respected Brother Asquith. I did. Um, and Brother Asquith is like a man of renown. He is, sure. he is, he's an amazing Bible yeah, uh, scholar, him. like self, yes, probably self-taught. I don't think he, yeah, he, 40 years, you know, he went, he, but he, yeah, he can talk know. about, I mean, yeah. he's, he's amazing. Yes, sir. Yes, I've sir. heard him preach before. I heard him speak about an hour on the King James yeah. too. It was amazing. Yeah. Yep, he's um, he's spent, so he you, loves it. You respected him for the, those four I did. years. I did as a man of God, even though you're uh, like. But do you know why? That man, he would come to my house and he'd say, "Dale, all you are, you're just a godless wimp," and he'd point his finger in my <laughs> face and tell me I'm a godless wimp. I said, "Man, you can't say that to me. Don't you know who I am?" And I'd I'd raise my fist back to go punch him. My wife's in the corner crying, and he said, "Dale, go ahead and hit me. It's not going to change my love for you." I've never had a man do that because any other religious worker would have left me at this point. Yeah, said forget it. He ain't worth it. He's not worth it. And I yeah. would, I would cuss him out, kicking him out of my house. He'd come to my house and hand me his credit card. And I'd look at him and go, don't you know I'm a thief? I'll steal this money on here. He goes, go ahead, it's God's. And he'd have a tear in his eye and he said, Dad, we just love you. I said, oh, my goodness. Get out of my house. Don't come back. And I'd sit at the edge of the ch- table and I'd say, Amy, it's my wife. I said, I want what that man has. I seen something in him. And 10 years ago, bro, I got what he had. I got Jesus Christ. I got born again. I got Amen. saved. And it turned my life from, I mean, completely flipped my life. So some preacher came and it was just time. Love me. From out That's of right. Ta- yeah, some God preacher was came from out of me. town and yeah, it was just time. No question. 100%. And the Amen. man just loved us. He prayed. He preached that Bible straight down the line and just loved us, man. Yeah. And uh, something that was very uh, unnatural uh, t- that I didn't know at that point because uh-huh. I didn't meet a, like I, I know a lot of good men now. Yeah. But I didn't know that then because I've just seen a lot of people coming in and out of jail being re- a religious worker. Sure. Except for Brother Love. Yeah. I love yeah. Brother Love. Oh, you knew Brother brother Love? Yes, when- I, did. I met him a few times before he got sick and left the uh, Monroe County Jail. No kidding. Yep. Okay. Yep. I worked with him a few times and I loved the man. Loved the man. Well, yeah, in, in the, all the inmates did. He's genuine. He sure. came in like day 100%. after day after day. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we have another guy in our church that had worked in the jail ministry yep. a little bit. He said yep. he'd go in there, everyone would be like, uh, have you seen Fred Love? Fred you, Love. Like everyone was asking for yep. Fred. That's right. Yeah. And he's, yes, he's in the hospital. He, he might go to heaven very well, soon. Hey, all right. So 89 years young. He did, his, he did what he, he had did. to. He, start, he started in the ministry 25 years yes, ago. Yes, sir. Uh, after he retired and just faithfully, diligently, year after year, that's that's awesome that you knew, brother. Fred. Oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Love him. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That's great. Amen. And and uh, so 
this evangelist comes into town. I, and I do have to say too, uh, you're you got you got saved outside of prison. Correct. I've got two uh, up in the up in the north uh, country where I pastored for nine years. Two of the pastors in town. I worked in the jail ministry with. Sure. And uh, one of the guys, Derek West, he got saved in the penitentiary Amen. down in Florida. Sure. He's a good That's man a, of God. Yeah. And <laughs> he's a funny guy, man. Yeah. He always cracks me up. He always like kind of talk. He talks like a, a homeboy, man. Yeah. But well, he's yeah, a good, he's a real good preacher. He's no, got a pretty no, big church. I mean, I yeah. you know I he's assembly of God. I don't have him in the. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. But, but he's a good brother, man. Yeah. That's the Lord. I mean, yeah. He's always like, well, hey, bro, good What's to up, see bro? you, bro. Yeah. yeah, yeah that type yeah, of thing. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, good guy. And then another guy, and he's charismatic uh, as well, yeah. but Jeff Smith, a tall, dignified black gentleman, drives sure. a Lexus and, and pastors <laughs> on right on the square in Watertown. Everybody in Watertown knows sure. Pastor Jeff. And then all the guys in the jail like, oh, yeah, yeah. Jeff's yeah. my pastor. Yep. Yep. Like, yep. Uh, yes, all these guys. Uh, but the, but he was saved in the penitentiary as well. Amen. He grew up like you did. Sure. Uh, when he was 12 years old, he's running heroin for his uncles. I okay. mean, yep. you know, so he just grew up and Absolutely. that was the life and got sure. saved in prison. And mm-hmm. and uh, now, you know, both those guys are pastors. <laughs> Amen. And God does save him prison there's no question yeah yeah amen. there's amen paul says that the word of god is not bound yeah 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 and so how how did god call you into the um get to going back in so behind going back bars in. Yeah. voluntarily well, behind bars voluntarily. voluntarily oh lord have mercy you know i had no inclination i had no drive to go back in you know I th- I, that's this point i was a sunday school teacher me and my wife co-taught uh, ninth through 12th grade sunday school and i loved it mm-hmm. you know being a trustee in the church and such and so uh we had a couple come in who had a, just a little small outreach going into the jail locally at Allegheny County. And they're like, hey, man, you know, guys would love to hear your testimony. I'm like, man, look, they can hear it when I come out, you know, or when they get out or whatever. I did not want to go back in. and Well, they kept at it. And uh, I, I finally re- reluctantly said, okay, I'll go. and went and took the class and uh, to get in and such. And so um, I just went in to give a simple one-time testimony. Did you have to get a special permission by the, the sheriff I because yep. of your background your record if, even even to go to college i have to sit in front of a committee and get special permission because of the violence on my rap sheet yeah 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 i would figure it is yeah but um you know what it's okay because it's at that time i that that opens up a huge door of opportunity for me to tell people about what jesus christ i'm both secular and christian and, and you found reception yep uh, by by these people working on yep because yeah, their hands are up in the air they don't know what to do with that's these right. guys they've no. tried every program they that's right you know yep. millions of dollars into these programs they don't work sure yeah and you know i've even had uh college professors write uh write stuff for me to you know about my character and stuff you know to b- allow me to get special permission to go in places and such and so yeah uh, that's just how god it's funny because my next door neighbor is my ex correction officer when i was in prison who I've been able to witness to help him out with money and talk to him about Jesus. Uh, so what what do you get from uh, Acts 16 about the Philippian jailer? Oh my God. Yeah. Um, what do I get? As in... Okay, so I'm thinking a little... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, no, sir. no, no problem. Um, I'm thinking... You're good. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, I'm thinking that here's a guy who's probably very cynical. He's seen mm-hmm. the same. I mean, mm-hmm. the longer things continue, the more they say the same. They've mm-hmm. probably seen so many um, jailhouse religion type stuff come through. So Paul and Silas come through, sure. a couple of nut jobs, singing yep. praises all night long. But then all the prison doors open. And like any penitentiary you've been in, if all the doors were open, what would happen? So... <laughs> They'd be gone. Oh, heavy, heavy. I don't care if they're yeah, praising sir. Jesus. Oh no, that's right. Or not. Yeah, they'd, they'd, they're gone. They'd, they'd be out the door. And it's so funny that you say that because when I f- first seen him and again he recognized who I was, um, he was kind of shook. And I just said, "Hey, man," I said, "Don't worry, I'm saved now." Yeah. And for him to hear that, he was like, "Damn, I, I, I've worked in the penitentiary for almost thirty years." Yeah. Do you know how many times I've heard that? Yeah. So let's go back. So a correction officer, just like a police officer, is going to be pretty cynical. 100%. Because the difference between a police officer and a pastor, I'm supposed to look for the best in people yep. and their potential. Sure. And a police officer sure. or correction officer is supposed to yep. look for the worst. Yeah, it does. Yeah. No, that's you're exactly <laughs> They're like right. trained the exact Perfect. opposite sure. of a minister. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so fast forward uh, probably seven years ago. 
I found I was having a conversation when he was having a hard time and, you know, we were able to help him out and financially Amen. and I was just be able to give him my testimony. And he said, Dale, he goes, after living next door to you, he's legitimately my neighbor. Yeah. Um, he looked at me and he said, after being in a penitentiary for so many years, he goes, I see a lot of people claim this Jesus. And yeah, that. he yeah, goes, yeah, yeah. he goes, you're the first one I've ever run into that's lived it. Yeah. After all these years. And yeah. that's why they're so cynical. Oh, yeah. This Philippian oh, jailer. No question. I mean, 100 percent. Yeah. 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 And I still today, when I go to the Monroe County Jail, yeah. Why do you come in here? There's no hope for these guys. Right. Thank yeah. God, brother, you know what? Thank God that nobody gave up on me. Thank God that yeah. God didn't give up on me. Yeah. I had to talk to a parole officer about somebody coming sure. here and, you know, to, to tell the deacons what the, you know, what this guy did and stuff. Yeah, sure. and his testimony. Somebody yep. through brother, brother Love got saved and he is living for the Lord. You know him, uh, you know, and, and, yep. I, um, yep. so I called his parole officer. Uh, and he said, well, let me tell you what he did, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it was kind of like, you really want this guy to come into your I know, church. I know. And the parole officer was completely poo-pooing the yeah. fact that this guy sh should not be anywhere yep. near church. Sure. You know, yep. I don't. That's how they look at it because they've yeah. heard it how many times? Yeah, absolutely. Constantly, oh, over and over. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So much so that they, they become very hateful towards the name Jesus. Yeah. Oh, boy. It's, it's Yeah, it's almost... Um, you know, it's almost as bad as like, uh, like let's say, pastors' kids who sure. their dad was a big hypocrite sure. or something. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're gonna you're walk right. away from religion and sure. never come back. 100%. Yeah, you're <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so it's yeah, it's the same thing with these sure. these prison guards. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they make it known. Uh huh. They don't have a problem making oh, it no. known <laughs> oh, <laughs> whatsoever. No. Yeah, yeah. That's but neat. you know, it, it's those type that that I look at and I go, you know what. Lord, teach me how to win that man to Jesus. Amen. That's the one I want to win to Jesus. Yeah. He's the one, Lord. Teach me how to do it. Yeah. And, you know, coming from my background um, and, and putting up with a lot of the stuff that I have to put up with from the deputies, yeah. um, God has brought me a long way and had to teach me through the years on how to handle something like that because mm -hmm. back in my type of lifestyle, we would have never put up with anything like that. Yeah. It just we would have went to fist to cuffs, and that would have been. Yeah. Yeah. You know, looking and, but, down, yeah. you know, cynical. Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. but you know what Paul says this? He was called, and here's the word, separated unto. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of men say they have a calling on their life, but what about that separating unto for the gospel? Amen. And that's what God has done with me over the years is he separated me unto this uh, ministry here in the Moreau County Jail and working with that community because yeah. um, I come from there, but it doesn't mean I always knew how to handle uh, you know, of being on this side. And so God has put me and my family through numerous things that were, and that much needed things yeah. um, that in order to teach me to be what he needs me to be, to benefit him for his kingdom and for those people to get saved, not to benefit me. Trust me, it didn't benefit Yeah, <laughs> You know, yeah. it benefits God and what he yeah. wanted to do with my life. Amen. And so, uh, it's, and it started with me going to give that testimony, and then I ended up going four times, and it was that fourth time that... Uh, so you were essentially drug in for it. I was drug in. Yeah. Okay? That fourth time I left, I was in tears, and I just knew that God had called me back to the jail and prison ministry, and here I am. Amen. That's what we do, and I love every minute of it. Yeah. I wouldn't. I couldn't even imagine myself being anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. So so what's what's the plan in, in your ministry as far as... Um, I think of a couple things. You're you're trying to challenge a lot of churches to be involved in. That's right. We want safe places for these men to be able to go to uh, mm -hmm. when they come home. Uh, we we want to work with the families while they're incarcerated. Mm -hmm. uh, get their families acclimated into a church. Get them used to a church because that's going to make it easier for those guys to want to come home and get into a right. church. Right. That's kind of a missing link. Um, that's happening between jail ministries and churches, local churches. You know, I I know quite a few local churches in the areas that I want to work with to be able to get that going. One of, I've done that with um, Pastor Fenton. Mm -hmm. yes. um, he knew somebody, so I got, hooked him uh, up with a guy, with uh, Joe Pertico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he'll be going to that church. But, you know, let's say you. I say, you know, hey, hey, Brother Jack, I have a guy I think he would be perfect for your church. Here's here's what he is. Here's what it is. Why don't you and the deacons pray about it and let me know what you think. Right. What an awesome thing to be able Amen. to have that family come in and sitting in the mm -hmm. church, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ safely. Absolutely. We have to do things safely. And, and you know, we've seen this with inmates a lot of times. Sure. And I, um, 
the whole time I was up in Watertown, I was working the jail ministry, and then also sure. before that, when I was um, assistant pastor out in Michigan, it was jail, not prison. There's a That's difference. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah, but, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But a lot of these guys flourish when they're incarcerated. Sure do. And then they get out and they go to the same neighborhood. They have the same peer group around same. them, and there's no church that they've Correct. plugged into. Right. Uh, and so they fall back in the old ruts. Sure. They're feeding. The, you know, all there is is the food for the flesh. That's right. Yes, sir. And it's not the church that comes knocking on no, the door. It's, that's right. It's, it's the homeboys. Yeah, and, yeah, no question, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And you know, my goal is this. This is what I tell you know people. They say, well, what is your what is your goal? One family. Mm-hmm. One family, born again, sitting in the church, you know, growing yeah. in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. If, if, if 20 years, God gives me 20 years in this ministry, and one family is born again, let's say, sitting in your church. Amen. It was worth every minute of it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Every second of it to see those souls saved yeah. and sitting. You know, I mean, yeah. it was worth every minute of that. Right, and and that's what a soul is worth. Sure, one hundred percent. You know, what is a profit of man if he gain the whole world that's loses right, his own soul? So no we question. know that one soul is worth more than the whole world combined. Sure. Um, yeah. So you get you, you got that uh, one family that you that uh, yes, you've you've made the difference in. Everything is worth it. And uh, so you're working with churches as these guys get out, and yep. then also you're trying to um, help churches. Uh, um, get involved too. That's right. Get involved. In yeah, absolutely. Get mm-hmm. them involved. Let's say there could be a church out there that wants to start a, a small jail ministry or whatever. We can come in and help them and, mm-hmm. and be a support. We're also a help to churches. Let's say you were I, in a jail and you needed Bibles or study I materials. Think, or I really think there's nothing better than the jail yeah. ministry. Now, uh, in the state of New York now, at least under the current administration, yeah. is yeah. that the jail population has shrunk enormously because sure. mm-hmm. um, they're just not as carcerating as many people. Sure. Uh, but there's no other place that you can go. You can go out door knocking or street preaching sure. until you're blue in the face. Yep. But you go into jail in one afternoon, you'll be able to witness for like th- uh, hours and hours on end as you go through the pods and yep. uh, things like that. And then also there's no other place like – you know, my people will tell you that I'm long winded. <laughs> I try not to be. I really try That's not to. Good. But it, it, it's tough. It's a losing battle. No, I understand. Um, and, and but you can go in oh, jail. Yes. Oh yes. And preach for an hour straight, and oh. they're with you the whole time. The whole and time. they're sad to see you leave. Sure thing. Hundred percent. And and so you know you can have hour straight Bible studies, yeah. Yeah. and um, it's amazing. And it and it's not. A, it's like one of those things where. Um, not only you being blessing to them, but you you're you're 100%. becoming strong. Oh yes. Like if you were um, going through the the pods talking to people, you're going to get asked about everything. everything oh under yes. The song. Better believe it. And so if you don't know your Bible, you're well on your way to especially with them guys. Yeah. Because you know they know their. Bible. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like oh you're a Christian. You know the oh, Bible yeah. pretty well. Yeah. yeah. They're gonna yeah. they're gonna put you to test because <laughs> yeah, they've been doing nothing else sure. all week but sitting yeah. there and reading the Bible. Sure. Uh, yep. And so you're going to have cults in there. You're going to have uh, everything. There's nothing you don't hear. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I'm mean, like, where else can you go? That's right. No. So yeah. I mean, in one week's time, you yeah. know, in the jail ministry, you're going to get uh, more witnessing experience than sure. you could. Yeah. And I'm for door knock and for street oh, preaching, all that. Yeah. No question. But you're going to get more of that in, you know, oh, in, yeah. in a few weeks in the jail ministry sure. than you would in like 10 years sure. out going door to door. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And just, yeah, we do. We get churches involved also in the, you know, uh, pen pal ministry we have mm-hmm. uh, where it's men with men and women with women, but yeah. no no personal information is right. exchanged. Everything comes through me through email. Then I can send it to them guys because I don't want names, what state right. you're in. Right. But, you know, just I remember how important mail was to me being in prison. And sure. I get a card from somebody that doesn't even know me, tell them they're praying for me and that Jesus loves me. Yeah. That meant a lot to me. And oh, so man, yeah. uh, we do that. And then we do an encouragement card program I started. Uh, and we remind people, too, yeah. that uh, when you've done this unto the least of these, my, bre- uh, my brethren, That's right. no question. you visited me where? That's right. In prison. That's right. In prison. Yeah. And so uh, you know, it's a way that for churches, for a person who doesn't want to get involved in any uh, you know, face-to-face ministries type stuff, well, here, I got something for you. Yeah, that's awesome. You can awesome. write a letter or, or yeah, whatever. That's powerful. So, um, yeah, there's there's many. I was, I, was t- I was checking my clock just yeah. <laughs> just not make sure that we're not missing church. No, honestly, yeah, yeah, sitting here talking. <laughs> we're having a good conversation. So sometimes yes, t- we're in like a time warp. But yeah, yeah no, we're good on time. Yeah, yeah. So you're working with the churches in yep. these different ways, different ways, and then um, uh, just you know, and the families. I do. Uh, so when the guys get home, I start in-home Bible studies with mm-hmm. them. Uh, and I like to take guys from the church who want to volunteer and, and come on, let's go. I'm, you're you're going to come to this in-home Bible study. I'm going to let you meet this family. And then you can take over the in-home Bible study. Yeah. And that just helps acclimate the guys 
uh, or women, whoever it is coming out, that prepare them to want to come into church. Yes. So let's bring them in on a Wednesday where there's, let's say, not as many people show up or whatever service yeah. might be somewhere. Yeah. And that person is going to be more uh, apt to want to come in and hear it because they've already been acclimated with somebody in the church. Yes, amen. And, you know, um, for you can just imagine for, well, for church people, we've been going to church for a long time, sure. so it's not it's not scary to go into church. Correct. But for people who don't go to church, yes. it's petrifying it is. Yep. to go into yep. church. Yep. Yep. You, you're very scary. It's very so scary. So how much more Correct. is it for uh, someone just got out of the penitentiary? That's right. And, and, it, and it really is because a lot of, you know, some may not be, but some, oh, most are. I mean, most just don't trust anything or anybody, I mean, as far as they can throw them, you know? Yeah. And they're thinking, nah, that's right. these people don't want me. That's right. And, that's right. Yeah. But God, oh, brother, if I could just, I, I wish I could express it. Uh, over this microphone and on that camera, how much God has opened doors for me with these men. Mm -hmm. People that were once, um, uh, they, they hated, they would tell me to my face how much they hated white people. Yeah. Who now are my best Bible students, man. I mean, yeah. just just men like that because they understand that I come from where they come from. See, when I go into the jail, I wore short sleeve shirts. Yeah. I got a hundred and some tattoos on, yeah. on me. Yeah. And when I walk in with them short sleeve shirts, they go, Something different about that guy. Yeah, amen. And uh, well, in you know, the Apostle Paul's. You yeah, know, sure. I, I become all things to all men. Oh, that's right, bro. And uh, yep. And so, I mean, I, I mean, I, don't, you know, if I go up to jail, I don't need to do that. I'm, I'll say I'm, I'm from the mean streets of Marion, New York. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Population thirty five hundred. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah so that, but as long as long as you care, that's you right. Know, no that, that's all. That, yeah, that's right. But for you, there's a testimony there. It is. And you use what God has given you. Use that 100%. testimony. Yeah. yeah. But you know, because there's there's not a lot of guys who do get saved who go back to the people. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not a lot of men who are getting saved who are going back into the jails and prisons. Right. And I was reluctant to it because you spend so much time in there. You're just like, ah, I really don't want to. But God put the calling on Amen. some men's heart to get back in there yeah. and, 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 you know, get them saved. And then we can send them back to their own people and, and let, the, you know, let Jesus Christ do what he's going to do. I, I think we would see a huge revival uh, break out within the jails. I, I really do. Amen. I'm, I'm Amen. confident of that. Yeah, that is a that's a great mission field. Yeah, 100. percent Yeah, and it's definitely wide on the harvest. Oh yes, sure. sir. And and so this plan for the church. How about the plan for the inmates? I mean, like, how do you um, how do you do ministry inside of the prison or inside the jail system? Is there like a a certain yeah, um, so, yeah. So you know, to get into the jail, I had to go sit down with the sheriff. Obviously, because of my past criminal history, mm -hmm. I sat down uh, the sheriff, the under sheriff, and and the administrator there, uh, Matthew. And I sat down with these guys, and they're like, you know, we have seventy six religious workers in here. Why should we let you in? And I said, well, first of all, I said, you know, I have the experience of being in here. I understand where those guys. Are. I said, secondly, what I want you to consider is where people don't want to go minister. And they all just looked at each other and they said the mainframe. And so that's where they put me. The mainframe is a place where uh, they can't hand, be around other people. They can okay. only be 10 people per pod. And not a lot of people like to go minister to those guys because yeah. they're brutal. Yeah. They are just the worst nasty. of the worst. Yeah, yeah, the worst of the worst. And I said, that's where I want to go. And they're like, okay. And that's where I've been for the last two and, a half, yeah. two and a half years. I've been in there. And so what they let me do is go to the back of the mainframe and they let me preach to two floors at one time. And I oh. go around all four and I preach right in the back corners. Um, before COVID started, I was able to pull them up into the gym. Okay. Which they don't ever let the people in the mainframe do that because they're too violent. Yeah. Well, they opened the doors for me to bring the men up to the gym and allowed me to have 30, 40 guys Amen. sitting in a room together wow. and preaching the Bible to them. And yeah. that's just some of the open doors that God has given me yeah. in the place. Yeah. And so you're you're preaching to these guys. Yeah. You're going in there for the services. And yep. um, what, what else... Um, do you have going on for them like during the week when you're not there or is there like um is there like a preaching service like a kind of like a church service then a bible study service and then a so what discipleship they, program so th there or something was like that. that okay they, they had that until covid mm -hmm. and now they're saying they're not going to have any of that back until at least the year of 22 22 oh, so wow. what they've done is me and two other guys they asked us personally if we'd come in and preach the services Okay. And so that's all we're going to do now is all services. Uh, yeah. for, you know, we're going to break up the floors 
each man I have their own section. I'll be doing the mainframe and yeah. the, the special housing unit. Yeah. Um, those are the, that, those would be the places that I'll be designated to go, and the okay. other guys would take care of some other spots over there. Is there um, is there any kind of correspondence or any? any I do kind? have that. I yeah. do have. I, yep. They used to um, now when I when I was out in Wayne County sure. working for my father. Yep. There was a guy named Ron Morris. I don't. Did know. you ever meet him? No. Well, he was a chaplain um, there. And then, uh, then there was Paul Burris too. I don't okay. know if you ever got a nope. chance to meet him, but they had good news jail, good new jails and prison ministry. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And so they had discipleship curriculum and it was actually pretty good. Sure. Yeah. And, um, I mean, all it was, was questions and yeah. essay questions mm-hmm. off. Mm-hmm. These guys would just have to read through sure. the Bible and it wasn't easy. No, right. either. That's right. They had to put a lot of work. That's right. That's it. good. Yes, sir. And so if they, if they got through the whole new Testament, then they would get a, a, um, very nice Bible. leather Bible. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yep. And um, and again, they, these guys had to put a lot of work in. To sure, get that do, nice that's Bible. right. Yeah, amen. Yeah, yeah. So give them something to something to do. I try right. their mind. No question, hundred uh, percent. And then there was um, there was folks at different churches and that would correct this um, awesome. discipleship material, sure. and then it was send it back in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, correct it and and yeah. So I do have that. Um, one thing I do is uh, the Lord put on my heart uh, probably about four years ago is I started a devotional where every every three weeks the Lord gives, get, I get a message. I write it down in a devotional form, and I send it to them for a personal Bible study when they're in their in their cells. But then I also go out. I have a ton of study material where, they, you know, like you're talking about the good news, you know, where they fill out the questions and send yeah. it back and get corrected. So we, we have all the books. Uh, book I go out and get tons of books and Amen. reading material for the men. Bibles. Oh, I'm, I got 700 Bibles sitting at home right now. Yeah, that's great. And to, to give out to these men. And so, uh, you know, I go out and buy good quality Bibles. You know, that's it, a $25 Bible. I get them for six bucks. No, no kidding. tags, no shit. Uh, they're wow. beautiful. I got one out on the table here. You can see oh, it. When okay. you, just beautiful 11 point, uh, five font. Yeah. L- letters of Jesus Christ in red explains a little bit about the, why the history of the King James. And, you know, I want them to have something good because it makes them feel like, man, somebody really took the time to get this for me. Uh, yeah. You know absolutely. What I mean? Somebody took the time it, to, and it's something about ownership of a it Bible. Is. It's, yes. um, yeah. Cause I used to go in on Fridays when I was sure. uh, over there in Wayne County yeah. and walk through the pods. And I sure. think it was six different pods in, uh, for the guys and do this with the girls. But we'd go through the pods sure. and uh, go around with the briefcase and, hey, do you have a Bible? And everyone wanted right. the daily bread. Sure, yeah, and, daily you know, bread. Yeah, of <laughs> so course. We'd, yeah. we'd give yeah, all yeah, those yeah. out. Um, but, yeah, they was, it was very important to guys yeah. to have their own yeah. Bibles. That, yeah. that is great. It yeah. is. And, and so the devotional um, – like they have daily breads and such, but the devotional is a personal message from somebody who's been where they at. That's what yeah. I. That's what. That's what they tell me. Yeah. It's. It's not that it's uh, any uh, anything special beyond what they get, but it's that fact that it's somebody who's been where we are. Yes. And now they're giving us that personal. This guy, know, yeah, this guy really knows is. what it yeah, is to no be question. me. You know, yeah. he's been in my position. Yeah. My, yep. Yeah. From my perspective, that's and the, great. And it makes a big difference. So we, we have over 200 devotionals we're sending out right now. And it's just, I mean, it's growing rapidly. Outstanding. Since COVID has closed the jails down, we get between five and eight new people a week. Yeah. I mean, handing yeah. out Bibles, devotional, yeah. study material. Like I said, all the way across to California and all the way down south to Florida, we got people in the states in between. Yeah, I feel, yeah, I feel very sorry for those guys that are incarcerated. Oh, man. Same thing with all these nursing homes, too, with sure all thing. these nursing home sure ministries thing. and uh, yes, senior living. Yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. go in there and have Bible studies no, right no, now. Right. Uh, it's terrible. It is terrible, brother. Uh, well, society puts no value on the soul. Sure don't. <laughs> and, You're right. You know, the, the physical aspect, that's uh, that's God. That's no all, question. all important. So. Absolutely. Uh, but, yeah. Interesting times. Yes, well, sir. Fascinating. Hey, good conversation. Yes, sir. Thank you. Where, if people are listening, where can they, um, if they're interested in your ministry, getting a hold of you, where, where can they find you at? So we do have a Liberty Behind Bars Facebook page. Mm-hmm. We also have, you know, Liberty Behind Bars at gmail.com. And then uh, on that information, we have a web, website, one soul at a time dot net. Amen. They can get a hold of us uh, through that. And so Amen. you'll see different avenues of contact, phone numbers, and stuff on there. Okay. Celebrity Behind Bars. Find them on Facebook, and then what, what Gmail. Was, yeah, and Gmail. Yep. Um, and, and then uh, uh, one soul at a time dot net. I smile because I, I I thought that sounds like Dr. Jan John Ashquith. That's right? yes, <laughs> one soul at a time. Yeah. Yeah. We That's started that. Yeah. Okay. We yeah. started that, and now hit the the. Uh, Black I mean, that was definitely his over. influence, though. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One soul at a time. Yeah. That's that's I, I, yep. It made me think of him when you yes, said sir. that. That's awesome. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. Hey, I appreciate you being on Thank today. You, sir. We look forward to having you tonight yes, in the service and presenting to the folks. I know they're in for a real treat. 
Uh, so God bless you, and uh, tune in. Next week, we're going to have Pastor Bruce Craig on. Uh, he's going to be talking about grief with us, and I know you'll enjoy that episode as well. Thank you so much today for watching this podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you'd like to reach out to us by way of email, you can email us at pastoralthoughtsmail at gmail.com. And if you'd like to, I do write a blog, and you can subscribe to that at pastorjack.org. Thank you, God bless you, and have a great day.